Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Some folks might be filtering back in, but I'm going to begin with introducing our next session, which is our panel discussion. This panel is going to address the question, whose responsibility is it to make research accessible? And on our panel, we have Raja Kushalnagar, who is the Director of Information Technology at Gallaudet University. We have Julie Williamson, a lecturer at the University of Glasgow and Vice President for Publications for ACM Sinkai. We're joined by Neil Seufer, Principal Architect of MathML, by Sarah Kane, a student at the University of Pennsylvania with a focus on astrophysics research by Kevin John Black, who is the preprints product lead at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, by Frank Middlebach, the technical lead of the LaTeX project team. And this group is moderated by Bill Kasdorf, who is the principal at Kasdorf and Associates and W3C Global Publishing Evangelist. You can take a look in the chat to find links to their full bios. These panelists represent many different points in the ecosystem of research from authoring to tooling and to publishing and in between. Thank you all so much and over to you, Bill. Great, thanks a lot, Shamsi. Um, well, I have to say that the uh, beginning group of presentations was just fantastic. So, you know, I think one thing that we've found in the accessibility community is that nobody questions the importance of accessibility. And that's, and everybody really understands that it, we need to solve some very basic problems. But I think what really came through is not just how important it is, but how darn complicated it is, right? So I think what I wanna do to start Given that uh, this is an archive forum, so uh, this is a key subject and potentially one of the hardest is let's start talking about math. And I think I'd like to start with Neil Seufer. Uh, Neil, could you give us just some background? Uh, let me let me like frame it this way. Um, I wouldn't say there are a lot, but there are a number of different tools and technologies for authoring math. And in my experience, um, asking somebody to use a different tool is a non-starter, right? Pretty much people are gonna keep using the tool that they're using. So rather than focusing specifically on tools, can you talk about whatever tools people are using to author math? Are there some things that they can do to make their math more accessible? What kinds of things should they be thinking about? Yeah, there's, well, um, they should be thinking a little bit about the tool chain because some parts of the, doesn't matter what you author, if the tool chain takes away the accessibility, that's Good that's point. the end of it. So yeah. um, it's been one of the things that surprised me for years and years uh, in the publishing industry is that virtually every tool um, that people use to produce math could have produced MathML, but instead they put an image in and then they have the issue of how do I get the image and get the math back to be accessible. But in terms of authoring the, the math, um, I think most of this community probably are tech authors, so late tech authors. And there are some things you can do to make life better um, for uh, people who don't have the chance to see it. Um, and one of the things is stop tweaking, stop tweaking your math. Like don't put extra spaces in just because you think it looks a little bit better. Um, don't do weird things to your LaTeX because that often means the tools won't pick it up or they'll do some weird things and the end result will be poor. Um, and then one of the things I want to emphasize is um, MathML continues to evolve, and although it's been great for accessibility, uh, the difference between now and 10 years ago in terms of accessibility on the web is enormous, um, but uh, because of MathML, but one of the things that can really help it in the future is a notion that we're adding to um, the MathML spec called author intent. 
And the way that could get picked up is via tech macros. So an example would be uh, if you used vertical bars and you wrote vertical bar X vertical bar, what is the screen reader supposed to do? It could say vertical bar, ver X vertical bar, but that's not what people are used to hearing. They're used to hearing something like the absolute value of, or the determinant of, or the cardinality of. Um, and so if you use the macro such as, I don't know, backslash ABS or backslash DET, tools could pick that up and put that into the math ML in a way that it gets translated to be spoken as determinant or um, absolute value. And so I would encourage people to, for future proofing, um, is to start using macros more often than raw characters. So when something has meaning, then it's expressed. It also tends to make it easier to produce a better looking document because the macro can be tweaked to look a little better. Maybe the vertical bars need to expand or not expand and so on. So um, that would be my encouragement is um, try and keep as much semantics into the original document so it can flow through to the output. Kind of a long answer, sorry. That's okay. Those were very good, uh, good tips. That's exactly what I was looking for. And I think uh, next, I'd like to turn to uh, Kevin John Black, um, because uh, you're kind of the counterpart to archive with MedArchive and BioArchive, so it's mainly biomedical content rather than physics and math content. Um, can you talk a bit about you know, your experience, uh, particularly in, in getting that content into accessible form? Yeah, the, and again, you're you're also <clears throat> publishing preprints, which is what we're all about here. The actual papers, not, not having gone through, you know, peer review, editing, production, traditional publishing processes. Sure, thanks. Um, uh, although I I also serve as uh, a, a technical support uh, person and manager for our uh, Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, peer review journals too. So I, I see it on a couple of different sides, but um, yeah, oh my God. I, I wanted to thank all the panelists. I, I've learned so much already this morning and I will be the first one to say uh, that I, I, I may be, uh, Cynthia said, I may be an ableist hierarchy uh, victim because a lot of the work we've done has been for papers once they're published. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to go back to the drawing board and start thinking about how we can add more descriptive information to the peer review process, uh, because a lot of that metadata is not part of the user experience for peer reviewers. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to try to tackle that. Um, yeah, I, I sort of... I look at it, um, we've done a couple of things uh, at BioArchive and MedArchive uh, to help accessibility. Um, BioArchive was launched in uh, 2013, and in uh, 2018, um, we started offering uh, full text HTML for all the papers, the backlog and the new papers. And we did that through um, uh, a partnership with both our online vendor, uh, Highwire Press and our compositor uh, Nova Tech Set, and just to give people a little bit of the background on how we make the papers accessible as fast as possible, when papers are accepted in the submission system uh, bench press and sent over to Highwire, um, the paper, the PDF, and the metadata is available within about 20 minutes at the most. Uh, Highwire also simultaneously uh, sends that mecha package of all the source files to our compositor, Nova Tech Set. And then uh, the full text HTML is then transferred back to Highwire and we make that content available within 24 to 48 hours of the paper being posted online. Uh, it, it took a lot of work, but it, it made uh, the paper more accessible for um, for HTML readers. But also, we do a, um, 
uh, text and, and data mining uh, HTML, excuse me, XML uh, archive for people who need to download the XML and, and use it. Uh, I, I think the next step of the process would be twofold. And one is in education. Uh, we would like to uh, expand uh, descriptive alt text uh, because unfortunately, I think right now of the alt text that we offer for uh, imagery uh, is, is, is most likely the captions that are already available. And I've already learned through um, talking to my partners uh, and panelists that that just means that screen readers read the description twice. So we need to provide tactical ways for authors to provide that descriptive text and also training for how to provide the best descriptive text. And, and I, I, I've worked with a lot of uh, peer review systems and um, I'm interested to uh, talk to uh, uh, Stacy um, <clears throat> about uh, Taylor and Francis and, and what they've done because I haven't seen that capability at a number of uh, the different submission systems yet. So uh, I'm excited to try to incorporate some of those ideas going forward. That's actually one of the things that whenever, whenever I'm asked, what's the, what's the one development in the whole ecosystem that I would most like to see? It's like collect image descriptions in the submission system. Mm -hmm. just, just build it in, just, just build it in. And you know th that's critically important if you're talking about medical images because you know you don't want somebody else trying to figure out what that's about when the author knows why they put that image in that paper, right? So so that's critical. And actually, to stay with that theme a bit, I, I'd like to switch to you, Sarah, Sarah Kane, um, because you know you're in astrophysics, and if there's any field that to me seems like fundamentally visual, it's astrophysics. And here you are a blind astrophysicist. So let's hear what you have to say. That's really interesting. Yeah, thank you so much. I definitely got that all the time growing up. How are you going yep. to do astronomy if you can't look through a telescope? And of course, we don't really look through the telescopes anymore, um, right. but there is still <laughs> a problem of the things on our computers, which is how we do everything now, still being inaccessible in a lot of ways. Um, we've already had some great discussion here about you know, the steps that are going to need to be taken to make the math, the symbols, things like that more accessible via, via screen reader. That's very important, um, but I think that's a little bit more on the software side of things. And so I will leave that to more of the software experts uh, in spite of its um, incredible importance. And instead, I want to make a, um, a comment or a request specifically to um, authors, to professors, and to publishers here in this group um, of, our, of our audience, both as a blind astrophysicist and as an undergraduate student. Um, currently, descriptive text or alt text, these descriptions of images, which are incredibly important for people like me to access um, figures and charts, things that are really the, the bread and butter of most astrophysics paper, um, alternative text is often considered an afterthought if it's included at all. Um, but this can be a standard that we change within the community. And if you are a professor or if you are at one of these publishing groups, um, if you're at a journal, you have immense power to change that standard. So if you are a professor, my request to you is that when you are teaching coursework to undergraduates or graduate students and you're teaching them to make graphs and figures, please teach them how to add alternative text. There are wonderful resources just to Google away about best practices for alternative text that you can then pass on to your students. And when students submit assignments with figures, with graphs, make descriptive text, make alternative text a required part of the assignment. You can't get full credit if not everyone can access your figure. In the same way, we can make things more accessible to colorblind or low vision users. In order to get full credit for a figure you submit to a class, well, it should be colorblind friendly. There are wonderful colorblind friendly palettes. 
It should be clearly labeled. It should be easy to see. This will make it better for low vision users, but also for sighted users. It'll make it better for everyone. That will start this sort of gradual, almost generational change where students become used to um, image descriptive descriptions being part of the norm in science. This is just a thing you do. Publishers, you have the power to make this change too. You can make it a requirement that for a paper to be submitted to your journal, it must have image descriptions. This can be a requirement that you implement, and these image descriptions should go through the peer review process just like the rest of the paper. And I think you'll find that they'll benefit not only blind folks like me who really, really need the image descriptions, but also any sighted readers, because I think we've all had the experience where we look at a figure in a paper and go, what is going on there? So that's the point I want to emphasize here. We can start to in institute policies that will make these changes, these accessibility changes, the norm within science. And if they become the norm, everyone will benefit. That is absolutely fantastic. And you know, uh, I tend to be a cheerleader on these subjects. That's why they made me the global publish, uh, uh, publishing evangelist in the, in the WCC. That's basically means cheerleader. Um, but um, this is actually happening. So, you know, Stacy is a good example because Taylor and Francis does in fact require uh, authors to provide image descriptions with their manuscripts. And that's for books, not just journal papers. They're, and they're a huge scholarly publisher of both books and journals, but at another end of the scale, not tiny, but not Taylor and Francis huge, University of Michigan has been doing that for years, uh, requiring image descriptions in order to accept a manuscript for the press. So, and one other quick comment, I'm not gonna take up too much time because I'm the moderator, I'm not technically a speaker, but the subject of captions came up. The obvious reason not to put the caption in the, in the alt text is the caption's already there. But the other thing is it's a different thing. The, the caption is about the image. The alt text is what does the image show? Those are two different things. They're not the same thing. So, um, but, you know, one thing that I observe often in my uh, accessibility work is that almost always the focus is on visual disabilities. And so I would like to turn to Raja because uh, the, the subject of uh, uh, people that are perfectly able to see but can't hear uh, is often uh, ignored. To be to be blunt about it, and of course there are people like um, the, the earlier speaker who is deaf blind who's got both problems. But uh, so Raja, what kind of comments uh, do you have in terms of uh, are you seeing any progress? Are there things that are kind of obvious to do that people are just not realizing they should be doing, et cetera, to to make sure they're more accessible to uh, to the deaf community? Hello, I'm Raja Kushal Nagar. I'm from Gallaudet University. I like to joke that, you know, the many interpreters don't know how to say my name because we're just spelling it right in the first sentence. So in written English, it's that spoken to printed English. So now I, they're saying more and more that when I print these presentations, it's becoming more sort of a both auditory and visual process. Now, more and more presentations are becoming more expansive about what's included in these papers. And some online papers themselves are becoming more interactive as well. There are more demonstrations and things involved in these to help readers understand the content better. So it's not as simple as creating printed documentation to provide access. There are many different modes of access available that can be used. It's not just visual access, auditory access. We also have deaf people, deaf blind people, and blind people, like we mentioned before who are going to be accessing these papers. So we need to shift that lens even further in thinking about 
seeing, you know, increasing that challenge, trying to print papers with, you know, what about ASL publishing? How do we do that? We have PDF support, of course. And how can we, you know, have movement involved? Now, of course, that's a challenge. There are a lot of other challenges involved too, but we also have other formats available that can be more interactive in publishing. There are a, a many more models of accessibility uh, that are available, but that's another story. The simple thing I would like to emphasize is that we can be more creative in the publishing industry uh, and we can be more interactive as well. Great, thank you very much. And I probably shouldn't say this because I know there's a speaker coming up after us that is definitely gonna be making this point, but it was such a revelation to me recently talking to that speaker that, um, you know, a lot of us make the assumption that, you know, for say something that's uh, a presentation uh, on a screen and it's like, well, you can read the screen. And his point was that oftentimes a deaf person's first language isn't English, it's ASL or BSL. Uh, so that's, that's something you need to be aware of too. Don't just make the naive assumption that, well, they can read what's on the screen. That, that that's uh, that's maybe not not accurate. Um, I think I'll go to Julie next because I want to save Frank for last. I think I've covered everybody. So Julie, um, again, just on the subject of making things easier for authors, what kind of advice do you have? What what kind of perspective would you like to bring to this? Yeah, um, I mean, I suppose when I started doing um, accessibility advocacy, maybe four or five years ago, um, I thought the biggest challenges would be in that kind of, uh, you know, author kind of training, getting people to support accessibility efforts, um, and that the kind of technical parts and the production parts, you know, those technical problems, we can solve those if we can get the community on board to, to buy into this. Um, and unfortunately, I found uh, the opposite is true. Um, I've, I've been really impressed with how much the community that I am in, which is SIGCHI, um, human computer interaction, um, how much people have kind of got on board, have developed the skills uh, and put in the work uh, and how hard some of the technical challenges have been. Um, sometimes I've had to appeal to authors vanity rather than their altruism, but we've gotten there in the end. Um, we, for example, I was lucky to be in a position to mandate things like uh, figure descriptions <clears throat> um, and kind of other source files that we need to provide accessible documents during peer review, for example. Um, and I feel like that part of the problem, um, at least in our kind of community of research, people people know the issues and they're mostly trying to do the right things. Sometimes we still have people providing, you know, uh, the captions as the figure description because they do it at the last minute. But for the most part, people really are trying to do their best. Um, and so now the kind of real challenges are still on the production side, um, doing this at scale, doing it programmatically, um, not requiring manual effort, and especially at that moment, not requiring author effort. They've put in the work already to make the content accessible. Um, and we ask them often again to do more work during production as well. Um, and the kind of main issue that I've found is this kind of fixation and attachment to print metaphors, print constraints, um, and really people are very attached to it. That's where a lot of the resistance comes in from authors and particularly where a lot of the technical challenges come as well, um, trying to continue producing documents that are good for print and good for accessibility. Um, and which has led me to a very uh, clear stance that I think PDF uh, should be sunsetted. I don't think we should use this as a format any longer uh, for any scientific publishing. Um, <clears throat> but that does require authors to change their perspective a little bit as well, working in different authoring tools, HTML, um, <clears throat> or other kind of formats that during peer review can be ac uh, accessible, and during the publishing uh, production pipeline are also amenable to being made accessible as well. Um, so if you are an author and uh, you want uh, accessible documents, help uh, to maybe move away from these print metaphors, move away from the familiar uh, of print metaphors and look towards kind of new formats and new authoring tools. That's my main uh, soapbox that I uh, am on these days. Yeah, that's great, thank you very much. 
Um, and uh, this is a good example of why I uh, saved Frank for last, because um, you know what we've got to deal with here is a balance between where we'd like to get to in, the, in an ideal world and how people are doing their work today, because millions of papers are being written and published in, as preprints and as journal articles, et cetera. Uh, and that's critically important. And I would say particularly for this audience, given that this is a, a, an archive uh, forum, I'd be willing to bet that a uh, huge majority of our uh, attendees live and breathe LaTeX, right? So, um, Frank, if I, I was going to say I don't want to put you on the spot, but actually I do want to put you on the spot because, um, you know, I know you know not only LaTeX inside out, but you, you, have a, you have access to where it's going in the future. Can you say anything about what some of the, most of our audience already knows what LaTeX is and they use it every day, right? So are there things that, are, that you see happening in that world that uh, uh, will be contributing to, to uh, f facilitating accessibility uh, as, as, the, as that tool evolves? Because LaTeX users are gonna stay LaTeX users. And, they're, and by the way, they're also gonna want PDFs. So uh, how, do, how, do, how does that tool chain authoring in LaTeX and ultimately publishing the paper as a PDF uh, get to be as accessible as possible today or soon? Okay, so yeah, so you put me on the spot. And uh, I, I'm sorry, but I should have told you I was gonna do that. that. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, and um, I must con confess that I, I don't quite agree with Julie because I think the world is big and uh, there are a lot of different types of qualities that people want to produce. And uh, I think, as you said, Bill, there is to be a balance because otherwise you do not achieve the goals that you're setting out for. And um, in this way, coming from, from the LaTeX side, um, there are going to be uh, very drastic changes because yes, uh, historically, tech was a tool written by Don Knuth for his own books because he wasn't fine with the print output of his books when they changed uh, at the publisher. That made a huge impact, but it was a very sort of handwork uh, thing to, to work in low level tech. LaTeX by Leslie Lamport came and put structure on top. So people could write structured documents, which is great in the sense because this is what you need for various back end further use of such documents. The difficulty back then was that LaTeX very, very carefully for, tried to forget as fast as possible that it has knowledge about all the structure in the document the moment it came down to produce a page because computers were small. And, and so the whole universe was focused on printing at this time and you could forget the structure as part of the process. As a result, what LaTeX is producing today still is unstructured PDF. And um, that's a huge problem. And I fully acknowledge the, the, the part that PDF is a difficult format to work with if you want to go and use it for other things that it was originally made for. And secondly, we don't have the structure in, in the PDF, which is important for screen readers, which is important for translating data, taking data out of the PDF and so on and so forth. That's the situation. Um, in fact, for quite a long time, PDF offers to hold this structure in the PDF. Unfortunately, that was never being really taken up by, by any software making use of the PDF. And the reason is kind of chicken and egg. You have on one side, 
no documents that produce structure. If we look at the STEM world, they are all LaTeX documents, more or less. And they didn't contain the structure in the PDF at this point in time. And on the other side, if, if there's no nothing to consume, why bother to write software to actually be able to consume? So we have a PDF standard, which up to now hasn't been really fully leveraged at all. Now, I come to the point where I, I, I say there's going to be changes in just about the time when COVID started, we uh, start, wanted to start with a multi-year project um, to change LaTeX to produce fully tagged PDF um, automatically. And um, this project is well underway. Uh, the reason why we, we wanted to do this is my belief is if you want to have accessible documents, there are certain things that you have to provide as an author in addition to if you want to just print something. The most important part is the question about um, the image descriptions, for example. This is something which I believe has to happen at the author level, because if it happens later, you always have a break in the in the uh, in in the workflow, and this break has the problem that whenever there is a change, all this work is is for nothing, and you have to restart. Because if the the starting document changes, then you you cannot guarantee that what has been put in, in, in the later part of the uh, workflow is still accurate. And it, it's this disjunct. And, yep. and, and so my belief is this kind of data has to, first of all, be provided by the author because he or she knows what actually is, is, is meant or what he or she thinks is, 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 is important about this picture. And secondly, it has to be part of the source. So this is this is a part where where LaTeX is is going to change probably already this June, um, where you can actually add this data as part of the LaTeX source, which means whatever changes in a half finished um, document or in a document that goes into peer review and then comes back and needs alterations, all this data is already there. At the at the very beginning, and and can live on and can be be used through the process. The second part is, I. There are millions of 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 LaTeX documents out there um, that are being produced basically daily. Uh, the the number is 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 very very high, uh, given the. Well, given the the size of the the, the documents uh, in total in the STEM world, um, the many of such documents do not go to formal publishing, where you have certain pressure to to um, to uh, get um, accessibility being done if we, if the community can 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 sort of change its way there, but they are documents that are being drafts, exchanged with others and so on and so forth. And, and there, my fear is the reality means if there is extra work involved to do something which people not necessarily experience as a problem for themselves or for the initial um, co-authors or co-workers they work with, it is very hard to do this extra work in the first place, even if, if there is good goodwill there. We just talk about these cases where um, captions are being used as, as um, descriptive text because it's last minute work. Yeah, it's last minute work because it's not their focus. 
Therefore, I think it is extremely important that something like LaTeX is taking this work away. And my belief or my conviction is we are in the position to do this. Because, as I said, initially LaTeX was designed as a structural system, and everybody who knows LaTeX knows that there is a lot of structure that you put as an author in. So if we are able to carry this through, and computers are now much faster, much, much more powerful today, so we can unwind what was necessary in the 80s and in the 90s, throw away this stuff, keep it and carry it through out to the PDF um, format, then we end up with documents that are UA compliant. And this is something that we will be able to achieve very soon for a subset of LaTeX. I'm, I'm kind of claiming um, that by June, we are able to do Leslie Lamport books as tagged PDF. So documents that are only using Leslie's core set of, 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 of tags will already be fully tagged automatically. The only thing that has to come in addition is the uh, alternate text. But of course, the world is bigger, so there is a couple of more years in, in, in the pipeline to make it really go through the huge universe of LaTeX and, and help the package developers to, um, to uh, uh, make their own extensions accessible by hooking into the system that we are currently in the process of providing. Okay, long, long answer to, to, to what you were asking. That's, thank you, that's exactly what I was hoping you would say. And I'm so glad to hear that there's, you know, I'm shocked that you're saying June, that's a couple months away. That's, this is not no, a couple it, of years it, away. It, it, will, it, it will not be everything. No, but it's, and, it's and we progress. Had, we, we had um, last week in, in this trial situation, uh, the document that Sarah looked at, um, or rather tried to listen to <laughs> in that yep. case, uh, which, which I said, it's, it's a tag document. Uh, and she said, well, my screen reader says it doesn't have any content. Yeah. And uh, I was a little bit sort of shocked. Um, then I, 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 I tried, tried to, to, to use the same kind of process that um, Sarah was going through uh, to do the screen reading. And I found, yeah, she's quite right. And the answer is, um, there was this, um, in, in, in the previous talk, there was these this, this, um, three layers, content rendering and um, the presentation from by the um, AT systems. We have this problem that um, in this particular case, in this example, it's actually Apple's preview, which is not supporting accessibility of PDFs unless they are extremely simple. It is not supporting actually the, the currently the, um, the um, st standard there for, for UA. It just doesn't understand anything that contains a footnote and that made it go completely crazy. Um, yeah. so, so, so there is this, this second side of it, if we are actually able, and I hope this is, 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 is kind of um, getting over this uh, chicken egg problem, if we are actually able to have automatically a large corpus of documents becoming accessible in this space, and uh, our goal is that old documents only need to be rerun um, to go through this and captions need to be sorry alternate text need to be added so so that 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 would be a manual extra but otherwise 
just take an old document and rerun it with one single line on top is the goal that we try to achieve. And uh, once those, those document corpuses are there, I think the pressure on the software side for uh, screen readers and voiceover and those kind of things to actually use the standard structures that the PDF is offering is, is probably something that we can push for because then there is actually something to, to, to work with before there wasn't in, in, in reality. And that, that was, the, was part of the problem, I would say. We only have about less than 10 minutes left and we've got a bunch of questions uh, in the chat. I think what we'll have to do is get back to people later on some of those answers. But a couple of themes, uh, I think I'll address one of them very quickly because if we get the whole group discussing this, that'll be the end of our session. And that is, you know, what about AI? This is the question everybody's asking about everything at this point. And they're particularly talking about you know, one of the one of the uh, questions that came in was about uh, generating the image descriptions with AI. Another one was about you know generating you know. Uh, uh, one was even saying, well, can you take a PDF and and render the LaTeX from it uh, with AI, etc. Um, I think uh, I think this, the answer there is there's actually a lot of interesting promise to the application of AI, and a lot, a lot, a lot of people are working on it right now, so stay tuned. Um, for those in the accessibility community, as particularly with image descriptions, almost never can AI produce a sufficient image description, and that's because they're very context dependent. Uh, what's its purpose in this particular paper or in this particular publication? Uh, is this educational? Is it, what level is it? Is it, is it for a, a medical student or is it for an undergraduate? Uh, you would write the image description differently in all of those cases. So um, I'm a big believer, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, about the concept of draft image descriptions. Get a draft image description from the author in the first place. And then if that needs to be refined for a particular purpose in a particular context, then you can refine it but at least you've got what did the author intend to communicate with that image in the first place. And there seems to be good consensus in this group here that uh, everybody seems to support the idea of getting the image descriptions from the author. So I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. Question about can LaTeX output HTML or is there a way to create accessible HTML from a LaTeX instead of just the PDF? I do want, I, I do want to just give a plug for Daniel Genev in the afternoon. There is a breakout session. There's a LaTeX ML, which is produced AR5 ML or AR5 IV. So replace the X with a five. Um, and they are using their tools that they've written LaTeX ML to convert the LaTeX to um, uh, HTML with MathML. And I'm sure he'll tell you all the problems that have come up and need to still be solved, but uh, yeah, pay pay attention to the afternoon session for the breakout session for that. Great, and Frank, you've got a comment. Yeah, I would second that uh, what Neil has said. Um, our goal is by providing um, the right kind of uh, data already in the PDF. Uh, it should be possible, become possible to translate that very faithfully to accessible HTML as well. Um, but that's sort of a an after step. And I think what uh, we will see in the, in the uh, I think it's section C, it will be very, very enlightening to, to learn about what is possible to go directly from LaTeX source to, to HTML. It will, and you know, one, you know, my, my, my job is I'm a, a, a basically a workflow and accessibility consultant, and I've been working on workflow my, my whole career. And one of my biggest frustrations 
is the extent to which there's so much valuable information upstream in a workflow that gets lost as the workflow proceeds. It's just tragic. I wanted to make one comment on exactly that, what, what Neil was saying about the math intent. This is, this is part of our goal as far as, 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 as the support for math is, that we provide this so that you can have uh, defaults about certain things that, that, that people only need to override if they have a different kind of meaning. So, so you could have something like the absolute value being already sort of passing through without the author needing to do extra work for this. This is part of, of, of the scheme that we try to solve there. We can go a little bit over our end time if uh, if any of the four of you or all of the four of you have something else you'd like to like to talk about at this point. Sarah? Yeah, thank you so much. You know, I, I definitely agree with a lot of, you know, the comments that have been made regarding math. And I, I definitely agree that that's a process that can be made, um, you know, in the software side of things, I, I definitely agree that that's a process that as much as possible, um, we would like to take away from authors. I, I don't want it to be extra work for authors to make their PDFs tagged, to make their math read out properly. Um, but I do want to echo some previous thoughts that in on the image description side of things, that's still an author's job um, and is probably going to be for quite some time because as, as you've mentioned, AI isn't there yet. Um, but I would like to reframe that issue from thinking about it as a problem to thinking about it as a benefit. Um, I recently heard some wonderful talks from people at the Space Telescope Science Institute who have done incredible work recently um, putting image descriptions on uh, James Webb images. Um, they're wonderful. And the people at STSCI talk about how adding the image descriptions themselves helps them understand the images, the data better. So as an author, I think there's value in describing in words um, what your image is doing and what information you want to convey in it. It will benefit you as the author, and it will also benefit all of your readers, um, not just blind people like me, but I think there's immense um, potential for uh, for audio accessible files for uh, to be useful to everyone. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of, of audiobooks. Lots of people like to listen to audiobooks. It's quite handy when your hands aren't available. Um, it would probably be really useful if you could listen to a paper now and then while you're doing the dishes. Think about all those archived daily summaries you get, um, you know, where you don't have time to read all the papers that are interested are, are, are interesting. So, you know, there's value for everyone when things are accessible, both on the author side and on the reader side. Um, I know that's a bit of a pivot from our previous uh, our previous comments here, but I just want to encourage you to think about um, paper accessibility from the framework of universal design, that when you make things accessible for disabled people, you're actually just making it better for everyone. That is really a core, core principle. Sarah, thank you so much for articulating that. Raja, you're next. Yes, this is Raja here again. Uh, thinking about the image descriptions, that can be a challenge as well, um, as well as a challenge to make auditory and speech uh, perfectly match to the print. It's not always a one-to-one -one match between spoken and printed language. For example, things may be spelled a different way in, in British English or American English and other things like that can affect that process. It's not always clear what the speaker means either when they are speaking maybe a different, there may be a difference between the speaker and the listener in their languages. So that can cause some vagueness and lack of clarity. So to the point of the speaker's responsibility to, it is the speaker's responsibility to make it clear what they would like to present in that printed word for speech, uh, as opposed to those image descriptions or video descriptions. So, you know, you can automatically put that information down and feed that through that formatting to decrease the confusion, increase the access like that, if you make that an automatic part of the process. So I'd really like to sort of sympathize, to emphasize that happening at the beginning of the process, making accessibility 
in all different ways, especially now we have these automatic options available. And, you know, we can save that information without losing it. Excellent. Yeah, good, excellent point. Kevin John, you're the next on the line, in the line here. Yeah, no, um, Sarah, I, I agree with your comment about uh, forcing uh, the onus on to uh, authors. And I think there's a I think there's a real benefit back to education of not making the descriptive text required, but just ha having it in the interface. You know, it, it, a, a, a good old what is this in parenthetical with a space to put it there, because I think it will open the eyes on so many people that don't realize the benefit of having that there. So I think just adding it into uh, submission systems will will increase awareness. And, and I think it's really important to have it in situ where people are adding that information because it's a, if it's on an uh, author's iFora page out on a hosting site, people will not catch it. But having it right there in, in place, I think is really strong and important. Yeah, but a quick comment and then Julie, you, I'll give you the last word. But one thing we haven't talked about is uh, outside of this community, the most commonly used tool for authoring scholarly papers is Microsoft Word. And Microsoft Word has that right now. You know, the, you, you, there's an accessibility tab in the review pane, the re, uh, in the ribbon, and it'll prompt you if you have an image that doesn't have alt text, it'll give you a little window to type the alt text. It also gives you a little button that says, make my alt text for me. And I tell people, don't hit that button <laughs> because that's AI generated alt text. That's not what you want. But um, so progress is happening in various contexts and various tools. Uh, Julie give you the last word here. Yeah, it follows on kind of directly from what uh, Kevin said and what Sarah said as well. Um, just as, I mean, I feel quite strongly that authors absolutely should put in the work to make documents accessible. Um, I feel no guilt uh, enforcing this on authors in my community, even if they send me angry Im Im messages. Um, <laughs> The work is not that much, right? It's it's really not um, a burden unless we ask authors to start doing the production work as well, right? That's out of the scope of what authors should be asked to do. Um, and it, it results in better papers. I, I find writing figure descriptions for my uh, figures helps me understand what I'm trying to get across in these in these documents and these images as well. It makes a better paper for, for everyone, uh, not just authors who, who need the figure descriptions. Um, and so the kind of, I, I feel no guilt asking uh, this work of the community, um, but there's a nice balance I think that, that we can, um, that I want to achieve anyway, at least in my own advocacy of balancing how much work the authors do and how much work the, you know, goes, works into the production flow um, and the kind of production process. Um, and that's kind of still part of the challenge, but, uh, but yeah, I think building that culture where Authors put in the work, the publishers put in the work, and we can get somewhere really much better than we are now if we do that. That's a good summary of the whole point of this forum, Julie. So thank you so much. And um, so I will turn this over to Shamsi at this point.
And another question is about data sets, uh, because increasingly that's part of an article is the, is the research data. And by the way, another thing that I think is really important developer, development is the output isn't necessarily an article anymore. It, you know, there are all kinds of different outputs from research uh, that researchers need to be able to exchange in the course of their research. And uh, waiting a year for an article to get through a publication process is kind of uh, uh, a non-starter these days. Um, and uh, there actually are a couple, couple questions like that. There's a very specific question about Jupyter Books accessibility or is there uh, any comments on that? So I, I decided I would just throw out a number of the topics rather than reading you all these long questions and see if the panel has any comments on any of those while we have uh, five minutes left in our session. So um, I, 